I'm here with Keith Mansfield at the Centre for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. Um, Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself, Keith? Of course. So I'm Keith Mansfield and I studied mathematics here at Cambridge. Um, and then my career since doing that has probably been a bit different from many mathematicians and has gone into books. And so I write a series of science fiction books, but they're quite full of mathematics and science. And I also publish other people's books on mathematics and science. Until recently, I was the maths publisher for Oxford University Press. And since leaving there, I helped come up with the ideas for a new TV series called It's Not Rocket Science. So these are some of the fun things that mathematics can do for you. Mm, sounds pretty exciting. Uh -huh. And what is it that you like most about doing mathematics? Ooh, so I, mean, I love that if you can do mathematics, it sort of makes you special. It gives you special abilities or powers that not everybody seems able to do. So it's like, almost being a superhero with those those sorts of special powers. Um, the way you think can be quite different from other people sometimes and give you advantages in all sorts of areas of life. But in terms of how you think about things, for instance, most people, if they think about the world around them, they might think it exists in three dimensions or if they think particularly deeply about the world around them, they might think it's four dimensions because you have three space dimensions and then time. But if you study mathematics, you learn to think in many higher dimensions than that, which is really fascinating. And some problems that you deal with, you actually work in infinite dimensions, uh, infinite dimensional space, which is just mind boggling and it's really difficult for someone who doesn't know mathematics to be able to comprehend, but using that kind of level of thinking, you can then get very clever solutions to real world problems in, in, in the here and now. So maths is a very powerful tool. So I also like something, something about mathematics that I also like is how you can apply it to lots of different ideas. For instance, for me being a science fiction author, I like to think about aliens and alien life and you can apply mathematics to that. And one of the things I think about and that I think is a bit of a problem for science is the apparent absence of aliens in the universe. And some people say to me, oh, that's not a problem, that's not an issue, the, the distances we're talking about are so vast that it's obvious why aliens have never come here. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. The nearest star to the sun, Alpha Centauri, is more than four light years away. And these are incomprehensible distances and no one would ever be able to travel uh, uh, across that, that vast expanse of space. But you can think about that mathematically and you can weigh that argument, which sounds very plausible. And if you model a civilization anywhere in the Milky Way that maybe sends uh, that maybe sends people out to the nearest star and they build a colony and then they go out to the next star along and they build another colony and off it goes and they gradually expand they don't need particularly fast rockets or anything like that but you can tell that they will be able to fill the whole galaxy very very quickly within five million certainly within 10 million years and five or ten million years might sound a very big number. From mathematics, we also know that the galaxy, the Milky Way, is actually 10 billion years old. So it's a thousand times older than the time it would take to colonize it. So we could have colonized the galaxy, aliens could have a thousand times over, and yet they're still not here. And that begins to make you think, well, it is a bit of a problem, it's an issue, where is everybody? Um, and one of my authors, Robin Hansen, has used some very simple mathematics to focus on that problem and what it means for the future of humanity as a species. Um, and he's developed this idea called the great filter, that there's something, some great filter out in the universe that is stopping intelligence spreading and filling the whole universe. And what is that? And when you look through your telescopes, and you consider the whole universe, there's not the slightest shred of evidence of aliens anywhere at all. So he says the probability of life filling the universe must therefore be very, very small. It must be very close to zero or else it would have happened by now. 
And then he splits that probability, he factors it into two different terms. And one is the probability of a civilization anywhere in the entire universe reaching the same sort of technological sophistication, the same sort of level that we have here on Earth today. And so that's one number. And then the other number he splits it into is the probability of a race that's at our point of development going further and reaching the point where it can go out and colonize the galaxy and then the wider universe. And we should be able to do that in two or 300 years time. But one of those two numbers has got to be very small for the overall probability to be small. So the great filter, what's stopping life spreading into the universe is either behind us in our past, and that's brilliant and everything's wonderful and we can look forward to this really rosy future, or it's coming very soon in the future and it's something that's going to stop us surviving the next two or 300 years before we start filling the galaxy. So is it behind? Is it in front of us? If it's in front of us, then it's something that should really influence our thinking for all the big problems facing humanity. So it should influence how we deal with a problem like climate change here on Earth. It should influence whether we're going to try and become an interplanetary species quickly and maybe colonize Mars? Or do we try and abolish nuclear weapons and get rid of the threat to destruction through them? Or build a shield to stop asteroids impacting the Earth, which we all know is how the dinosaurs were wiped out and would be very bad for us as well. And all these problems, great problems facing us, they all need mathematicians and mathematical solutions to, to solve them and keep humanity moving forward. So that's, th those are lots of reasons why I love mathematics and why it's so interesting. Hmm. So there's a big role for maths in, in the future of humanity. But what I, about I you? So. What is your own personal mathematical moment? Can you describe one? So for me, uh, a special moment in mathematics, I, if I think back to school, if I think back to, to my time in the sixth form, quite early on in the sixth form, um, actually a physics lesson, and people might think, why am I talking about physics when, when we're, we're talking about maths? But Galileo said the universe is written in the language of mathematics, and that's an amazing thing, and it means that applied mathematics is, is our way, is, is, is basically our route into physics, and the two are almost interchangeable for me. Um, and so I like to think about mathematical physics a lot. And back in the sixth form, um, the teacher said the next day we were going to be performing a famous experiment where we were going to measure the charge on an electron. <coughs> And how do you measure the charge on an electron? And he said as a challenge, he said, I want you to go home and think, how would you do this? How, how would you uh, solve that problem? And I thought that sounded quite an interesting problem. I wasn't doing anything that evening, so I started to think about it. And back in those days, and nowadays, we have flat TV screens, computer screens, and phones. But back in those days, televisions were these tubes where we fired beams of electrons onto a screen and we manipulated them with magnets. And using that sort of technology, it's very easy to measure the mass to charge ratio of an electron because you need that for where you're gonna fire the electrons. So that's quite an easy number to calculate, but how do you separate that out and get just the mass on its own so then you could work out what the charge is? So I thought about that for a while and then I realized one of the great mathematical theories is something called quantum mechanics. And it has lots of unusual consequences. And one is that particles like electrons sometimes behave like waves. And if you took your beam of electrons and you fired it at a very thin film, then what you'd get on the screen on the other side would be an interference pattern. So like if you look at waves in a pond and they're bouncing off the side and they're interacting with each other and they're interfering, it's the same sort of thing. And you could look at that interference pattern and you could calculate the wavelength of the electrons. And from that, you could calculate the mass of the electrons. And so you could build a mathematical bridge from that experiment back across and work it and use the equation to 
work out what the charge on the electron was. So I was very pleased with that. And I wrote it all up in a, in a nice way. And I took it into school the next day. And we got to the lesson. And there was no mention of this challenge the physics teacher had set the day before. And we just performed um, Robert Millikan's famous experiment for measuring the charge using oil drops. And the bell went. So I went up to the teacher, Mr. Russell, and I said, well, you said about thinking of our own experiment yesterday, and I came up with this, and I showed it him. And he looked a bit surprised, and it made me realise that not everybody was thinking about problems in these way, this way. And he took my notes away, which now I'm a little disappointed about because I don't have that, and it would be quite interesting to look back on. But I like to hope that back in Nottingham, where I went to school, they may be doing Millikan's experiment, and then they're also doing the Mansfield experiment, and they're seeing which gets the better result for the charge on the electron. But it made me realize that if you can do mathematics, you can think in a way sometimes beyond people who can't do mathematics, and you come up with these interesting creative ideas. So, so I, I was pleased about that. Well, that sounds great. And you've just said creative ideas, so that's my next question. Ooh. Like, How important do you think is it to be creative in mathematics? And so, and, and, and that, of course, is a really interesting question. And it's, it's very hard for people to say what creativity even is and, and define it. But, but if I park that for a moment um, and think about creativity in maths, as a publisher, one of the great books of the 20th century was by a guy called Thomas Kuhn, and it was called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's a book about how knowledge and scientific knowledge progresses. Um, and it's very, in, very interesting. And in normal times, Kuhn argues that people are just filling in the gaps within theories and doing the details. But if there's a problem with a theory, then you need creativity to be able to progress knowledge forward and to think up the new theories that are going to change the world and take us on to the next level. The example that they use in the book is actually for thousands of years people thought that the earth was the centre of the universe and everything revolved around the earth and then the Copernican revolution we call it shifted the earth to being just one of the planets orbiting the sun. And that makes the mathematics actually much more simple of how you calculate orbits and things like that. It's a much more elegant solution. And nowadays we know it's not just the Earth orbiting the Sun, but the Sun orbiting the Milky Way, the Milky Way part of the local group of galaxies. And that's a fascinating idea because it shifted us away from the center of the universe to just being average, to not having any kind of privileged position in the universe to not being special at all, which takes me back a little bit to my aliens because we're the only intelligent life we know, so that does make us special and different. And so how do you equate those two things is quite in interesting and perhaps another revolution in science beckons. But we are actually in the process of a great revolution in theoretical physics at the moment. Instead of thinking we know everything about the universe and what it's made of, we now realize that what we think we know about the universe is just that we can measure it. We can say we know about 4% of the universe, but 96% of the universe we know very, very little about. And most of that 96% scientists say is made up of something called dark energy. Um, but what is dark energy? It sounds very impressive, but it's just a label for something that we don't understand at all. We really know next to nothing about dark energy. And the great creative challenge for future mathematicians, or one of many, is to come up with an entirely new theory of the universe, which incorporates things like dark energy and dark matter into it, uh, so we can work out properly how these things interact and how things are the way they are, which, which is, is a fabulous challenge for anyone watching this video. That's great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah.